This book belongs to the most rare of men. Perhaps not one of them is yet alive. Welcome to part 1 in a planned series on Nietzsche's work The Antichrist. In this first video we will briefly introduce the work and go over some necessary context. In the following parts, we will do a deep dive analysis. If you want to be notified when these parts are released, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell button. As always, we begin with the title. The original German, der Antichrist, actually has two meanings in English. It can literally mean the Antichrist, referring to the character in the Bible that is predicted to come to earth in the end times. But it can also simply mean anti-Christian. Nietzsche is obviously being provocative by engaging in this double entendre, which is also why most English translations decide on the Antichrist as a title. Although, it must be noted, Nietzsche never uses the term Antichrist in the book to refer to the biblical character. He only ever uses the term to mean anti-Christian. The title of this work is also less mysterious than, let's say, Daybreak, Twilight of the Idols, and of course, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It's obvious what Nietzsche will attempt in this work, a sustained critique of the Christian worldview and morality. The Antichrist was actually the first installment in a planned four-volume work, which Nietzsche could never complete due to his mental collapse. The work was to be entitled The Will to Power, a transvaluation of all values. And the four volumes making up the work would be The Antichrist, an attempt at a criticism of Christianity, The Free Spirit, a criticism of philosophy as a nihilistic movement, The Immoralist, a criticism of morality, the most fatal form of ignorance, Dionysus, the philosophy of the eternal recurrence. As it stands, however, only the first volume, The Antichrist, was released as intended by Nietzsche. There have been attempts to reconstruct Nietzsche's original vision of this great work, but so far this has been controversial. This reconstruction is known as The Will to Power and it was heavily edited by Nietzsche's sister. Because of this, and because Nietzsche never intended these notes for publication in the first place, this reconstruction is not generally considered to be canonical. But back to the Antichrist. This work was written in 1888, which makes this book, together with the autobiography Ecce Homo, Nietzsche's final publication before his descent into madness. Just like with Twilight of the Idols, this means that this book is of a radical nature. The late Nietzsche pulls no punches in his philosophical writings. He wants to hit hard and provoke his audience. We will see exactly how as this series continues. Much of what we will cover in this series will sound familiar to longtime viewers of the channel. We will talk about décadence, the will to power, master and slave morality, and other Nietzschean concepts that were covered in other videos. We will link those in the description below if you need a refresher. This is necessary though, because, as translator H. L. Mencken points out, Nietzsche's entire philosophical project, in one way or another, has been an attack on Christianity, the culmination of which we find in this work. What he flung himself against, from beginning to end of his days of writing, was always, in the last analysis, Christianity in some form or other. Christianity as a system of practical ethics, Christianity as a political code, Christianity as metaphysics, Christianity as a gauge of the truth. It would be difficult to think of any intellectual enterprise on his long list that did not, more or less directly and clearly, relate itself to this master enterprise of them all. As this series goes on, we will dive deeper into Nietzsche's specific critiques of Christianity, of which there is a lot in this work. Just like our series on Twilight of the Idols, this series will serve as a sort of culmination and synthesis of Nietzsche's entire philosophical project. But it will be Nietzsche's project through a specific lens. Nietzsche against Christianity. Nietzsche as the Antichrist. But unlike our series on Twilight of the Idols, this will not be an analysis that took fragmented parts of Nietzsche's chaotic style and puts everything in a neat ordered whole. The reason is simple. The Antichrist is a remarkably digestible work. Of all Nietzsche's books, The Antichrist comes nearest to conventionality in form. It presents a connected argument with very few interludes, and has a beginning, a middle and an end. Most of his works are in the form of collections of aphorisms, and sometimes the subject changes on every second page. In this regard, The Antichrist is much like Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, which also set out a main thesis in a structured manner. By the way, we have also done an entire video on that book as well. 
The major themes we are going to tackle in this series are the following, in no particular order. The origin of Christianity, the development of Christianity, pity and other decadent values, priesthood, Jesus Christ, and the psychology of the Christian. Suffering is made contagious by pity. Under certain circumstances, it may lead to a total sacrifice of life and living energy, a loss out of all proportion to the magnitude of the cause, the case of the death of the Nazarene. This is part 2 in our analysis of Nietzsche's work The Antichrist. If you haven't watched part 1 yet, there is a link in the description. And if you want to be notified when other parts come out, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell button. In this part, we will go over the notion of pity and why Nietzsche thought that pity was one of the most harmful elements of Christianity. In earlier works, Nietzsche already spoke out against pity or compassion. For example, in a paragraph of The Joyful Science, Nietzsche laments how pity leads us away from our own path and our own individuality. Pity as a distraction. Indeed, the opinion of the present-day preachers of the morality of compassion goes so far as to imply that just this, and this alone, is moral. To stray away from our course to that extent and to run to the assistance of our neighbor. Nietzsche's demonization of pity or compassion is an obvious attack on Schopenhauer's philosophy, which held that compassion is the root of all morality and all that is good. In fact, he is probably directly alluding to Schopenhauer in the above passage. And it is true that for Schopenhauer, supreme goodness consists in complete compassion for other people and animals, so much so that a perfectly good person should forget his own individuality altogether. Of such a person, Schopenhauer says, he no longer makes the egotistical distinction between his person and that of others, but takes as much interest in the suffering of other individuals as in his own, and therefore is not only benevolent in the highest degree, but even ready to sacrifice his own individuality whenever such a sacrifice will save a number of other persons. Then it clearly follows that such a man, who recognizes in all beings his own inmost and true self, must also regard the infinite suffering of all suffering beings as his own, and take on himself the pain of the whole world. This is absolutely appalling to Nietzsche. In his formulation of pity, Nietzsche sees a denial of life, a resignation, a saying of no, a degeneration of man's primal instinct, the will to power. Pity, driven to its ethical conclusion, will make you part of the herd by stamping out your individuality. Pity is the primary virtue of slave morality. And it is therefore no coincidence that we find compassion, or the commandment to love thy neighbor, as the greatest ethical prescription in Christianity. One loses strength when one pities. Pity further increases and multiplies the loss of strength, which suffering in itself already brings into life. But this is not the whole story. There is another problem with pity. The reaction to pity, Nietzsche argues, is always disproportional to the cause. This makes pity extra insidious. Pity is the ultimate emotion of corruption, of degeneracy, because when we are being compassionate, we take the side of the weak and grant them a kind of power which they do not deserve. This, in turn, reflects badly on life itself. Pity towards the whole law of evolution, which is the law of natural selection. It preserves whatever is ripe for destruction. It fights on the side of those disinherited and condemned by life, by maintaining life in so many of the botched of all kinds. It gives life itself a gloomy and dubious aspect. Pity enables the proliferation of weakness, which quickly becomes a vicious cycle. Weakness begets weakness, as the strong are pushed out and eventually outnumbered and overpowered. We have done a more in-depth video on the dynamics of the weak versus the strong in our analysis of Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols. Link in the description. This demonization of pity goes against our modern sensitivities. Most people today, and back in Nietzsche's time, will say that compassion and pity are good things and that this world needs more and not less compassion. And that is exactly why Nietzsche goes to great lengths to hammer this point home. Pity leads to nothingness. Pity leads to nihilism. Pity has been called THE virtue, the source and foundation of all other virtues. But let us always bear in mind that this was from the standpoint of a philosophy that was nihilistic, and upon whose shield the denial of life was inscribed. 
Schopenhauer was right in this, that by means of pity life is denied and made worthy of denial. Pity is the technique of nihilism. Let me repeat, this depressing and contagious instinct stands against all those instincts which work for the preservation and enhancement of life. In the role of protector of the miserable, it is a prime agent in the promotion of decadence. Pity persuades to extinction. But at this point, a question arises. We can grant Nietzsche the point that Schopenhauer's philosophy leads to extinction. He even says so himself. My system, when it reaches its highest point, assumes a negative character. Thus ends with a negation. It can here only speak of what is denied, given up. But what is thereby won, what is laid hold of, it is obliged to denote as nothing. But Christianity, does this religion lead to nothing as well at its highest point? Surely Christianity promises us the second coming of Christ. It promises the kingdom of God. It promises heaven, the afterlife. How is this nothing? Back to Nietzsche. Of course, one doesn't say extinction. One says the other world, or God, or the true life, or nirvana, salvation, blessedness. This innocent rhetoric from the realm of religious ethical balderdash appears a good deal less innocent when one reflects upon the tendency that it conceals beneath sublime words. The tendency to destroy life. In short, for Nietzsche, pity is a sickness, a sickness that will destroy life. Followers of his philosophy, the so-called free spirits of the future, as he calls them, should take on the role of doctors and remove this disease from the condition of mankind. To be doctors here, to be unmerciful here, to wield the knife here, all this is our business, all this is our sort of humanity. By this sign we are philosophers. And with this call to action, Nietzsche ends the short but important analysis of pity. From here on out, we must always keep this diagnosis of Nietzsche's in the back of our mind, as Nietzsche takes a deep dive into the history and theology of Christianity and seeks to formulate a devastating critique of the religion that has defined Western civilization for 2000 years. It is necessary to say just whom we regard as our antagonists, theologians and all who have any theological blood in their veins. This is our whole philosophy. Welcome to part 3 of our analysis on Nietzsche's The Antichrist in which we will go over Nietzsche's attack on theology and those who think like theologians. The previous two parts are linked in the description. Strictly speaking, theology is the study of God, specifically in the context of this work, the Christian God. Every priest is a theologian, but not every theologian is a priest. Furthermore, Nietzsche's attacks are not limited to theologians proper, his attack is broader. Everyone with any theological blood in their veins is his target. Upon this theological instinct I make war. I find the tracks of it everywhere. Whoever has theological blood in his veins is shifty and dishonorable in all things. But what is Nietzsche's problem with theologians? And what does he mean exactly when he talks of the theological instinct? Chiefly, Nietzsche points out idealists as exemplars of those with theological instinct. The theological instinct is the tendency of philosophers and priests to look at reality with suspicion. A closer look at the passage from Twilight of the Idols will help us here. Philosophers place that which makes its appearance last. Unfortunately, for it ought not to appear at all. The highest concept, that is to say, the most general, the emptiest, the last cloudy streak of evaporating reality, at the beginning, as the beginning. This, again, is only their manner of expressing their veneration. The highest thing must not have grown out of the lowest, it must not have grown at all. The fundamental error of philosophers is that they cling to certain ideas. Ideas such as being, the absolute, the good, truth, and perfection. These are abstract concepts that, strictly speaking, do not exist in the material world as such. And because these philosophers have an instinctive hatred of reality, the most obvious sign of décadence, according to Nietzsche, they reason that these so-called high concepts cannot have arisen or evolved out of this material world. Their origin must lie elsewhere. Yet, these concepts also cannot stand in opposition to one another. They must all derive from yet another abstract concept, higher than all the rest, even further removed from earthly existence. 
Thus, they attain to their stupendous concept, God. The last, most attenuated and emptiest thing is postulated as the first thing, as the absolute cause, as ens realissimum, the most real thing. When Nietzsche speaks of the theological instinct in the Antichrist, he is referring to this mistake, postulating God as the first cause, as the ultimate reality. Nothing could be further from the truth, according to Nietzsche. The theologian flips metaphysics on its head. He puts first, the thing that should come last, or rather, the thing that should not have come at all. The idealist philosopher is also guilty of making this mistake. Arthur Schopenhauer and Immanuel Kant, for example, both have reasoned that not this world, but some other world, the will in Schopenhauer's case, and the thing in itself in Kant, is the ens realissimum, or the most real thing. But it is not just a metaphysical question. By flipping reality on its head, so to speak, the theologian also flips morality on its head. Wherever the influence of theologians is felt, there is a transvaluation of values, and the concepts true and false are forced to change places. Whatever is most damaging to life is there called true, and whatever exalts it, intensifies it, approves it, justifies it, and makes it triumphant is there called false. This is not surprising. The philosophical tradition, as far back as Plato, has equated metaphysics with ethics. If the world is a certain way, you must act a certain way. But what if the metaphysics are completely wrong? Well, then the ethics are also wrong. People erect a concept of morality, of virtue, of holiness upon this false view of all things. They ground good conscience upon faulty vision. They argue that no other sort of vision has any value anymore. Once they have made theirs sacrosanct with the names of God, salvation and eternity. I unearth this theological instinct in all directions. At this point in the Antichrist, Nietzsche begins an extended critique of Kant's moral philosophy. But we will not discuss this critique here. We'll make a separate video on the subject because it deserves its own in-depth discussion. If you want to be notified when this video comes out, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell button. The theological instinct against which Nietzsche declares war is of course best exemplified not in the philosophy of Kant or Schopenhauer, but in Christianity itself. Thus Nietzsche characterizes Christianity as being completely imaginary, making up imaginary causes which lead to imaginary effects. Under Christianity, neither morality nor religion has any point of contact with actuality. It offers purely imaginary causes – God, soul, ego, spirit, free will, or even unfree – and purely imaginary effects – sin, salvation, grace, punishment, forgiveness of sins. Intercourse between imaginary beings – God, spirits, souls – an imaginary natural history, anthropocentric – a total denial of the concept of natural causes. What this leads to is a distrust of the word nature. Once the concept of nature had been opposed to the concept of God, the word natural necessarily took on the meaning of abominable. The whole of that fictitious world has its sources in hatred of the natural, the real, and is no more than evidence of a profound uneasiness in the presence of reality. This explains everything. This is the breeding ground for décadence and ressentiment. We can see how this theological instinct is, for Nietzsche, the root of everything that is bad with the world. The theological instinct leads to bad metaphysics, which leads to bad ethics, which leads to a distrust of nature, which leads to a distrust of life, which leads to décadence, weakness and ressentiment. And the theological instinct finds expression in Kant and Schopenhauer, and with them, in the entire tradition of Western philosophy, but most of all, it finds expression in the religion of Christianity. And against this instinct, against this religion, Nietzsche will wage war and attempt to set the record straight. The rest of the Antichrist is nothing more than an elucidation of what was set up until this point. In what follows, Nietzsche will not really say anything new. Rather, he will make the case from a wide variety of perspectives historical, genealogical, theological, philosophical, that Christianity is opposed to life and nature. Nietzsche has said so himself in the previous quotation. This explains everything. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the Antichrist doesn't hold any value. Quite the opposite, in fact. This video was an exposition on Nietzsche's general critique of Christianity. 
In the coming parts, we will tackle his specific critiques of Christianity. There was only one Christian and he died on the cross. This is part 4 in an ongoing series in which we analyze Nietzsche's book The Antichrist. Previous parts are linked in the description. In this part, we will focus on Nietzsche's treatment of the central figure in Christianity, Jesus Christ. The figure of Jesus Christ is a complicated, complex character in Nietzsche's writings. On the one hand, Nietzsche is obviously opposed to all values Christianity stands for. On the other hand, Nietzsche speaks high praise of Jesus Christ as a person. To completely understand this dichotomy, it's necessary to make a distinction between Jesus Christ, his life and death, and Jesus Christ as he was later interpreted by his pupils, the Apostles, and, subsequently, by the Church and its history. Like many in the 19th century, Nietzsche was very interested in Jesus Christ beyond his depiction in the Gospels, the four books in the Bible that serve as a sort of biography. The Gospels were written decades after the death of Jesus, and they are not historical documents, but religious ones. What this means is that they are not necessarily an accurate depiction of what Jesus was like. The evangelists, those who wrote the Gospels, had an agenda. And it's this agenda that Nietzsche finds problematic, and it's this agenda that has ruined the figure of Jesus Christ, and which, ironically, gave birth to Christianity. The fate of the Gospels was decided by death. It hung on the cross. It was only death, that unexpected and shameful death. It was only the cross, which was usually reserved for the canai only. It was only this appalling paradox which brought the disciples face to face with the real riddle. Who was it? What was it? When Jesus was crucified, his apostles could not believe it. The death of Jesus was an unexpected event. Here was the savior of humanity tortured and put to death in the most humiliating way possible. Were they misled? What happened? This death of Jesus caused them great anguish. In all likelihood, some of them even felt cheated or betrayed. Nietzsche tries to understand the psychology of such an apostle. The suspicion that such a death might involve a refutation of their cause, the terrible question, why just in this way, this state of mind is only too easy to understand. In order to make sense of this perplexing turn of events, the disciples sought an explanation. The death of Jesus cannot have been a random event. It must have been special preordained and significant. And from that time onward an absurd problem offered itself. How could God allow it? To which the deranged reason of the little community formulated an answer that was terrifying in its absurdity. God gave his son as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. But according to Nietzsche, this is the opposite of what Jesus was about. A sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins? Nietzsche calls this absolute paganism. After the death of Jesus, the disciples started venerating him, putting him above other men, giving him a special theological status. But Jesus is precisely the opposite of an elevated figure. Jesus preached equality before God. Jesus himself had done away with the very concept of guilt. He denied that there was any gulf fixed between God and man. He lived this unity between God and man. And that was precisely his glad tidings, and not as a mere privilege. From this point onward, there is a corruption of the savior type. The death of Jesus is now seen as a sacrifice. Now there is need of a resurrection, or a state of life after death, none of which was really mentioned by Jesus himself. Nietzsche often repeats the sentence, the kingdom of God is within you, which is said by Jesus according to the Gospel of Luke. What Jesus meant is that the kingdom of God is not a place, or not something that will come in the future. The kingdom of God is within you. It's a state of mind. The kingdom of God is within you. It's already here. There is no need for guilt, sin, resurrection, or no need to be saved even. The Gospels had been, in fact, the incarnation, the fulfillment, the realization of this kingdom of God. You attain this state of mind by following the example of Jesus, by living how he lived. But his sudden death came as a complete shock to the apostles, who didn't know what to do and thus distorted his message. But where does this distortion come from? It's rooted in ressentiment. All that Jesus could hope to accomplish by his death, in itself, was to offer the strongest possible proof or example of his teachings in the most public manner. But his disciples were very far from forgiving his death. Though to have done so would have accorded with the Gospels in the highest degree, 
and neither were they prepared to offer themselves with gentle and serene calmness of heart for a similar death. On the contrary, it was precisely the most unevangelical of feelings, revenge, that now possessed them. Nietzsche argues that the apostles, and consequently all of church history, fundamentally misunderstood Jesus. They couldn't deal with his death, and to make the loss bearable, and to justify it to themselves, they invented notions like the afterlife. Now, death does not have the last word. It was a way for the apostles to get back at those who killed their teacher. Nietzsche points out with great irony that these two motivations, ressentiment and revenge, are the most unchristian of values. What happens next in the story of Christianity is that the apostle Paul will enter the stage and build upon the story of the other apostles. Paul's letters are actually the oldest part of the New Testament. The Gospels, the four biographies of Christ, were written at a later date. As mentioned previously, for Nietzsche, the Gospels aren't to be taken at face value, they are not mere biography. They already incorporate the faulty theology that was later added by tradition. The Gospels are invaluable as evidence of the corruption that was already persistent within the primitive community. These Gospels cannot be read too carefully. Difficulties lurk behind every word. In other words, the Gospels do not give us the truest picture of who Jesus Christ was or what he stood for. Already in the Gospels, the message of Christ is distorted. And this is the full meaning of the famous quote that says, There was only one Christian and he died on the cross. With this, I come to a conclusion and pronounce my judgment. I condemn Christianity. I bring against the Christian church the most terrible of all the accusations that an accuser has ever had in his mouth. We have seen how Nietzsche attacks Christianity on multiple fronts. Previous parts tackled his critique of pity and compassion, decadent emotions of weakness that found their sanction in Christianity. We have discussed Nietzsche's attack on the so-called theological instinct, the drive to reason away empirical reality and the material world in favor of some kind of hinterwelt or beyond, whether that be Schopenhauer's will, Kant's thing in itself, or Christianity's heaven or kingdom of God. And finally, we saw how, according to Nietzsche, even the message of Jesus Christ himself was distorted by his pupils after he was crucified. But what is Nietzsche's end goal in writing this scathing critique of the Christian faith? Nietzsche wanted a transvaluation of all values, a new system of ethics, of philosophy, a new system of life, completely opposed to the decadent values that he saw were dominating the culture, decadent values that found their source and justification in Christianity. Unfortunately, Nietzsche's mental health did not allow him to finish the other three parts in his planned tetralogy on the transvaluation of values. We must look to the future ourselves. But is there a period in history that might serve as an inspiration? Has such a transvaluation of values occurred before? Yes, it has. We call it the Renaissance. Is it understood at last? Will it ever be understood what the Renaissance was? The transvaluation of Christian values. An attempt with all available means, all instincts and all the resources of genius to bring about a triumph of the opposite values, the more noble values. This has been the one great war of the past. There has never been a more critical question than that of the Renaissance. Nietzsche finds in the Renaissance the revival of pre-Christian Greco-Roman culture, an age of nobler values. Above all, a celebration of life. In the Renaissance, Nietzsche finds an art so divine, so infernally divine, that one might search in vain for thousands of years for another such possibility. Even the papacy underwent this drastic transvaluation of values during the Renaissance. The corrupt Renaissance popes who used the riches of the Vatican to live lavish lifestyles full of bacchanalia and banquets, which are generally considered a low point in church history, find in Nietzsche's estimation a celebration of life where previously Christianity had promoted death. I see a spectacle so rich in significance and at the same time so wonderfully full of paradox that it should arouse all the gods on Olympus to immortal laughter, Cesare Borgia as Pope. Christianity itself no longer occupied the papal chair. Instead, there was life. Instead, there was the triumph of life. Instead, there was the great yes to all lofty, beautiful and daring things. But sadly for Nietzsche, the Renaissance did not manage to complete this transvaluation of values. Christianity survived. What happened? A German monk, Luther, came to Rome. 
this monk, with all the vengeful instincts of an unsuccessful priest in him, raised a rebellion against the Renaissance in Rome. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, launched an attack on what he viewed as corruption and excesses of the Catholic Church. But of course, for Nietzsche, these excesses and this corruption were a good thing. In Nietzsche's historical analysis, Luther was responsible for the failure of the spirit of the Renaissance to remove Christianity from Europe. Luther's Protestant Reformation was a restoration of the old Christian order, and Luther restored the church. He attacked it, the Renaissance, an event without meaning, a great futility. Luther's actions ultimately rendered the Renaissance futile, meaningless. A revolution was preparing itself in Europe, but it was stopped short by the advent of Protestantism. Still, the message is clear. Nietzsche invites us to look at the Renaissance for inspiration of what he envisions as his project for the future, the transvaluation of values. In the Renaissance, Nietzsche saw a renewed lust for life, an appreciation of beauty, an affirmation of existence, displays of strength and of a healthy culture. In short, in the Renaissance, he saw everything that Christianity is not. The transvaluation of values was supposed to be Nietzsche's magnum opus, a great work to surpass all others putting together everything Nietzsche had written down into one neat system. But he could not finish it. He only gave us the first step, the beginning of a philosophy of the future, as the subtitle of Beyond Good and Evil goes. But Nietzsche also gave us the harbinger, prophet and personification of this philosophical revolution. We are speaking, of course, of Zarathustra. Thank you for watching. This concludes our series on Nietzsche's The Antichrist. We hope you found this series valuable. If so, please leave a like and comment and subscribe to the channel for more videos on Nietzsche. If you want more Nietzsche in the meantime, we have done an in-depth series on both Twilight of the Idols and the genealogy of morals. Again, a thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.